Awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, yep. So this is going to be uh, learning how to fish with GoFish. Uh, let's see. So I am keeping an eye on the uh, Red Team Questions Discord channel. So if you post things there, I can kind of see them live. Plus, it seems like Marcelo has been uh, reading them off as we go. So that is awesome. I've done this talk two times before. And one thing that I'm pretty nervous about is both times it's gone like well over an hour. So I'm going to try to fly through it and probably cut down on my stories a little bit. Um, but yeah, we'll, we'll certainly get through it all where we can kind of show you how to fish. All right. So let's see. Um, the first of all, if you like social engineering, well, there's a whole conference all about it, Layer 8 Conference, June 6th. It is also virtual, so you can attend it from anywhere in the world. There's podcasts that go with that as well. Who the heck is this dude that's talking to you? Well, that's me. Uh, you can find me as PLabrity9 in lots of places. I work for Rapid7 as a pen tester, um, as well as organize a couple of things as well. All right, so get that kind of stuff past us already. Intro to fishing. We have our beginner slides here to talk a little bit about what fishing actually is uh, just in case anybody's here like um, wanted to come in and heard of it wanted to find out a little bit more and basically it is going to be social engineering through email there's a few different types of fishing that uh, you can kind of be aware of as well in addition just to the regular fishing there's also maybe you've heard of spear fishing which is when we go after uh, specific individuals where uh, a regular fish might be where we just kind of cast a wide net and just see who we can get, see how much we can get from who, as many as we uh, can try at one point. We're spear fishing. We do a little bit more investigation and get a little more information and try to target a single person. And that's usually going to be a higher level people. Or if we really want to go for somebody big, that might be referred to as the whaling, where we are going after maybe the, the CEO or the president of the company. Uh, somebody that's going to have some pretty high level uh, information or maybe even just system administrators so we can kind of get that access that Tim was just talking about where he was referring to that uh, better method of pen test with the assumed breach and a lot of times that does begin with phishing and a couple slides here I get some other stats that are probably similar to some of the ones that he was showing I think he was showing the Verizon uh, DBIR I might have uh, some similar things in there as well um, you might have also heard of sometimes the CEO or CFO fraud, and this is going to be involved with some kind of phishing as well. Uh, this is where somebody might fish into one of the, those types of accounts where they get into the CEO's inbox. From there, they can kind of look around and get a little more context on things that are happening. And from the CEO's inbox, that also gives them some additional credibility because they can start sending email to people as the CEO. Maybe the CEO even uh, emails to the CFO asking for particular uh, invoices to be paid. Well, let's see. Why don't I just put my screen into presenter mode? I guess that'll be a little more <laughs> professional and look better. All right. Um, yeah, so uh, CEO, CFO can kind of uh, email back and forth, get some kind of invoices paid. And we've heard reports of lots of money uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars, millions, maybe even billions of dollars that has been lost through some of these types of attacks, like the CEO, CFO types of frauds as well. So why do you want to fish? Uh, well, maybe uh, it's going to be all part of an entire social engineering engagement. There's other types of social engineering that can kind of come into play here as well, where we have our physical social engineering um, as well as some some vishing. Where the physical social engineering might be where you're trying to get actual access into the building. Uh, those types of attacks can still happen. Um, that was one of the things that Tim was referring to earlier uh, with the uh, one type of, uh, of a pen test where maybe you do want to see if somebody can get into the building, but it is also going to be probably much more common that that access is going to come through phishing. Now, vishing is a term that you've not heard of before. Well, it's just voice phishing over the phone, uh, being able to make phone calls and try to get access and into a network that way. Maybe you find different pretexts or stories that you can talk to somebody and find a way to get access into the network. Maybe get a password reset or figure out a way that over the phone, somebody will give you their own credentials. So why do we actually want to fish? Well, basically to get stuff. So what kind of stuff do we think that we might want to get? Well, access is certainly one. We get access usually through credentials. 
you know, through a username, password. Once we get that, uh, we'll probably want to then go looking for something like a VPN page uh, so we can use those credentials to get into a network through the VPN or get access into their uh, publicly facing uh, mailbox. And we can get some additional information out of their mailboxes as well, sometimes to install some malware and see what those types of things can run on there. Just basically, in the end, trying to get money somehow and see how that kind of thing could work. So phishing is also kind of a big deal. Uh, we do see that a lot of the breaches are going to involve phishing. Uh, and we see some of the statistics there with some of the footnotes as to exactly where these types of things came from as well. Um, a lot of the malware does come delivered through email. Um, most of the breaches do have some degree of phishing attacks involved as well. The FBI also in 2019 showed these statistics uh, where there was billions of dollars lost through phishing. So this is kind of a big deal and something to be aware of and probably something that you'll want to be working on with your users uh, and the rest of your staff. So everybody came here, I'm guessing, to learn how to fish. Since that was the title, you know, go fishing with GoFish, figure out how to do it. So yeah, we're going to go through uh, all the different steps figure out how to set up a campaign, maybe mix in some stories and examples with these kinds of things as well and see how it goes. So let's do this with GoFish. GoFish is a free tool that is uh, open source. You can get it off of GitHub, super easy to run. Uh, we'll go over all the different parts of it and kind of figure out how these things are gonna go together. And uh, once we see these parts, we'll see that really all we need to do is uh, set up these four steps, and then at the end, piece them together. Once we piece them together and kick off our campaign, uh, there are other phishing tools out there that you can use. And one of the things that I really like about GoFish is that it lets you run multiple campaigns at the same time. Some other tools might only let you run one campaign at a time, uh, but GoFish does let you have uh, multiple going on at one time. A uh, little shout out to Jordan Wright on Twitter, JW underscore sec. He is the maintainer of this. He's extremely responsive. So if you have any kinds of uh, pull requests or issues or anything like that, he's always great with these kinds of things. Um, and then there is also the URL where you can get this. Hey, Patrick. Um, yeah. We have a question from GoToMeeting uh, from Raphael who asks, can you show the slide again with the um, the, all the conferences that you mentioned before? That one? Yep, I think so. Um, but uh, like like we, we do with the rest of the slides, uh, Raphael, we can will um, we will post them on the internet, so you can we can grab those later if you want. Thank you, yeah. Patrick. Cool. Thanks. Yes, highly recommend Larry conference. All right. <clears throat> so we have the usual disclaimer in here. Uh, some of the things that we're showing can be illegal if you are using them without the proper explicit permission. So please be sure that you have that before using any of these types of tools. Um, you should only be performing phishing engagements with the proper permission. Um, that can even include inside of your own company. Don't just kind of figure that because you are a security person that you can just go ahead and start phishing your own employees and seeing what kinds of things happen there. Uh, make sure that you have the explicit permission well, for one, it's illegal, but for two, um, there can often be some kinds of trickery involved with social engineering, um, and people don't really like to get tricked. So if you irritate, piss off the wrong people, and you weren't supposed to be doing this kind of thing, you're probably going to get in some kind of trouble. Um, and you should only be phishing against these approved accounts. So if you're phishing against like gmail.com accounts, unless you got permission from Google, you shouldn't really even be doing that. Uh, same thing with just trying to fish your friends. If you don't have permission to do that, then I would recommend we don't do that. Uh, also during this presentation, we are not going to be talking about filter bypasses or AV bypass. That is a huge topic all in itself. Um, and I multiple times uh, put the emphasis on the social engineering. Uh, this isn't any kind of a network pen test or anything like that. For social engineering, that means we are uh, testing people. So that is really the goal of phishing here is to try to test uh, people and see what is going to be their level of awareness and level of training. So that is our usual disclaimer here. 
All right, already seeing some questions coming in on the Red Team Questions channel. Any other headers of an X mailer that you should remove uh, when delivering emails with GoFish? I actually don't remove any. Um, I just kind of let it go with its defaults. Um, and how do you usually create domains that are legit and get a good score? That's a, also a great question. One that we're gonna talk about as well, where we, um, I love to kind of play with the domains as well. Um, and I think what that question also refers to is um, some of the, the filtering that can come in place. We'll talk about that as well. So that's, those are two great questions that came in. All right, so the first step for setting up GoFish, it's really this easy. Um, and I also have uh, this explanation at the bottom. Jaime Hancock gave a presentation on GoFish at CactusCon 2019. Highly recommend his talk as well. Um, and this slide, if you check out his presentation, we'll see that it's extremely similar to his. And I fully admit that I stole this slide from him with his notice and permission. So thank you, Jaime, for all of this. All right, so how you install GoFish? Well, you can first, I usually just do it inside of uh, you know, a Kali instance. First thing that I'm going to do is go get Golang and unzip tools installed. And then the next thing is to go get uh, the GoFish uh, zip file. So I get uh, the GoFish zip file right off of GitHub. And next thing is to unzip it into a directory, maybe into opt GoFish. Okay, so we see that we're just going to unzip that file we just got. I put it into a particular directory. For example, OptiCoach, you can pretty much put it where you want. CD into there. And then we have an optional step, this Tmux step. It's not required. Um, highly recommend it though. Uh, what Tmux is going to do is even if your terminal gets dropped, we see sometimes where a connection can get dropped to a, a server, um, that if that connection gets dropped, that service might get cut off. And if you're in the middle of a phishing engagement and there's fishes out there waiting for people to click on it and waiting for people to hit your server and your service gets stopped, the engagement's not gonna work. That campaign's not gonna work. We want it to keep going even if your connection to the server drops. So Tmux is one way that you can do that as well. Um, once you have GoFish installed, super easy to start up, just dot slash GoFish. And it's then going to start up It'll show you uh, the port where the admin server is running. It'll show you uh, that it is going to be listening on port 80 or 443 um, and going to be available to take connections that way as well. Another question on the uh, Discord. Do you usually use GoFish as the primary mail server or in conjunction with a separate relay front? I use a separate relay front. I use another server and we'll see exactly how I set that up as well on a future slide here. All right, so now that we have GoFish running, we can start it up. Uh, by default, it wants to run on 127.0.0.1, port 3333. So if this is running on port 127.0.0.1 off on some other host somewhere, how do I pull that up in a browser? Well, I just usually do it through some local port forwarding, which I guess also kind of maybe helps me a little bit with the security of it and tries to keep other people out of it as well. Uh, your default, credentials for this admin and gofish you know you certainly can change those that would probably be a good idea but those are the defaults that will get you in there um, so as we go through these examples you'll see that that is exactly how i am accessing uh, my host um, you'll see in my browser probably that i am accessing it at 127.0.0.1 and it is running off on another server i have it running on a linode host um, and one of the things that you sometimes run into when you run these tools uh, like GoFish on another server like Linode is they might block some of the SMTP ports, the mail ports, um, and Linode does that. And that's just for security so that they don't become like a spam server. So I had to ask them to open it, explain what I was doing. They were great about it. They opened it all up. So if you use something like Linode and you want to do phishing from there, uh, the SMTP port might be blocked. So just to be aware of that kind of thing as well. Um, another question, do you send out recon emails first to see which may be bad addresses uh, from Honey Badger? Uh, no, I, I don't. And the reason that I don't send out emails first to see which ones might be bad is because the majority of the time it is a company that has um, hired me to do this kind of thing. And quite often they are going to give me the email addresses. There's going to be some times when they ask me to do the OSINT, uh, the open source intelligence gathering. 
uh, for the email addresses that I want to use. Um, and from the, all I'm usually doing is going on some of the uh, tools, maybe a LinkedIn, Zoom info, the company website, if, you know, if I can find a directory to kind of get names off of there uh, to construct my list. And if some of them don't work, well, that's possible that somebody left the company, that happens, uh, but that's kind of how I'm going to construct my list. The majority of the time, I get the list from the company that's hiring me to do the phishing engagements. All right, there is an incredible user guide for GoFish. Highly recommend reading it. Um, and it is at docs.gofish, getgofish.com slash user guide. And this is where we can start putting the pieces together. Uh, this is really the entire learning curve, which isn't too bad. Uh, there's the four different pieces that you just need to put together with this. There's going to be the sending profile, which is going to be information about your uh, mail server that you use, the users and groups, which are going to be who are your targets, your email template, which is the actual fish that you're sending out, and the landing page. So when somebody clicks on the link in the email, which is quite often the goal, where do they end up? That's going to be our landing page. And the last thing is going to be to create a campaign, which is where we tie all of this together as well. All right, let's look at each of these pieces individually. So first, the sending profile. This might be the kind of the trickiest one, uh, just because you gotta get the, the technicals right on it. So you just kind of give it some kind of name for your sending profile, just so you can kind of find it when you're putting it together as well. Um, you have your from, which is you know pretty obvious as to what that one is going to be. It's gonna show up. Um, in the fish, so that way uh, maybe put something in there that makes it look pretty believable on what the users are going to see. And then we have our host. This is going to be who is going to be our mail server for us. There's lots of different mail hosts that you can use. Uh, you can use Gmail. I also really like to use um, G Suite. One reason that I like to use G Suite is because I will often reserve a domain for my landing page. And my uh, landing page domain um, is often, I like to use ones that look a lot like the company name. Um, and with G Suite, what I can then do is register my domain with G Suite. And one of the nice things is they'll give you 14 days for free. Um, and <laughs> most engagements don't even last that long. Uh, so I'll register my domain with G Suite and all my emails will come from that domain from G Suite. And the really nice thing is that I can set up mailboxes where I can receive responses back. Because one example that I had a few weeks ago when I was doing one of these engagements was my, my pretext or my story was about uh, a, a new HR policy. So I was emailing people in the company telling them there was this new HR policy. And as per company policy, they need to approve and agree to the new HR policy. So my link uh, was to a page that looked like the company login. Uh, so Everybody went to the uh, login page and logged in. And then the thing that the, my uh, client wanted me to do was after people logged in was just redirect them back to the company homepage. There never was any new HR policy for them to read. So that confused a lot of people. And I got a lot of questions and responses to my fish saying, um, I logged in and I went to the company homepage. I didn't see any policy. How do I approve it? What's going wrong here? So it's kind of nice to be able to see that and I decided to step it up a little bit and have some fun with some of them. I think I told a couple of people, oh yeah, that's a that's a known problem that that redirect is happening. And what the problem is that your password isn't completely synced up in the domain yet. So go back and try it again with your previous domain password. And yeah, one person did that and I got multiple passwords from them and could actually see then uh, that they were uh, incrementing their password. So that was kind of nice as well. Uh, let's see. So from there, uh, the host, you know, I mentioned you can use Gmail, you can use G Suite, um, smtp.com is another source. Um, let's see, I think Mailhog, M-A-I-L-H-O-G is another one um, that I've seen referenced. You know, some of these can be a problem if your target is going to be whitelist, uh, whitelisting, blacklisting, filters for some of these types of things. I had one a while back that I was trying to uh, send my mail through smtp.com and I noticed, I found out that my emails weren't getting to the targets. So I spoke to my point of contact and I was like, what's the problem here? When, when we kind of talked it through, he's like, oh yeah, we get smtp.com blocked. We don't let anything through with that because that's, that's a company that does spamming. You know, They see a lot of spam coming through there and they would not lift their filters for me for that. So 
going to Google was another option. So that's something else that can come up if you use some of these other SMTP services. And it's really just gonna be kind of trial and error with that. So for the purposes of this demo, I did create a, uh, uh, a Gmail account where I can send uh, my fishes through. Uh, the DEF CON 401 is my local DEF CON group here in Rhode Island. Um, so that is going to be our sending profile. So whoever's our, 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 our mail server, we put that through there as well. Uh, another question on there, when clients hire you, do they typically ask for a credential fish? Uh, that's one of the questions that I will often ask, like what type of information do you want me to get? And I would say the majority of time, the answer that I get back from them is, I don't know, whatever you can. So that's what I'm usually going to go for is a username and password because I think that's pretty valuable um, in order to get that as well. Um, how do you maintain good sender reputation regarding MTA IP domain to prevent your emails from being gray listed, blocked, sent to junk? Um, well, you can go grab some expired domains that uh, have good reputation. Um, but another thing that I will very often have to do with the clients that I'm working with um, is that I explain to them or remind them that we're doing a social engineering test, that we're not testing their filters. I'm more than happy to also test their filters. And you can kind of think about it like when you're doing a web application pen test. A lot of times you do a web application pen test, first with the WAF in place, see how far you can get and then say, okay, I got blocked. Now lift your WAF and let's see what else that we can do. I look at it the same way with the social engineering phishing attacks. If you have filters in place, sure, I'll test them out. We'll see if we can get through it. And if we can't, now will you lift those? Because really what we are trying to do is gauge uh, how, how much understanding that your people have. Uh, so we really need to ensure that these emails get through to the people. We need to get them into the inboxes. So I highly recommend that you let my fishes through, that you lift your filters and let them get in that way as well. All right, uh, same thing for the last question that's in there I see. Uh, for your landing page, do you put it up a few days prior so it doesn't get blocked as a newly seen domain? Same thing, um, that's only really gonna get blocked by my client uh, and I just kind of work with them to make sure that those protections are no longer in place. So the one issue that you can have when using uh, Gmail for your sending profile um, is that Google has um, secure app access in place. And what that is, is they do not let third-party applications send mail through them, which, you know, that's pretty good. They don't, if credentials get breached for people, which we know there's millions of Gmail credentials out there, Gmail doesn't want to just be easily used as a spam sender. Uh, so they have this setting on to prevent third-party applications from using them as a mail server. Uh, so they, if you go into, uh, log into your Gmail account, go into myaccount.google.com and you see this security uh, tab over there, uh, you can then turn on the access and they even tell you they don't recommend doing this kind of thing. But then once you turn it on, this is then going to allow you uh, to send the mail through Gmail. So what you do want to have is allow less secure apps on. And what this does is once you give uh, your GoFish, your Gmail username and your password, it can then send the fishes through uh, the Gmail mail server. If you don't turn this on, then it's just gonna get blocked by Gmail and your fishes won't get through. All right, so that's the uh, setting, your sending profile. The next part is gonna be the users and groups. These are going to be your targets, the people that we're trying to get our fish to. So first thing we kind of do is name this, but I usually create at least three different groups. So the three groups that I am going to create is first of all, just myself. I'll create a group with just myself and that is so that I can ensure that the fish gets, that it, you know that my server's working, that the fish gets to my inbox, that the link works, that the landing page works, and that everything looks good. Once I know that you know, I have at least that much working, um, I'm going to create a second group. The second group is gonna be myself and my point of contact that I'm working with. And what the point there is what we're talking about with getting through the filters. We want to make sure that the, the mail gets through the company's filters and gets into the inbox. We can usually have a pretty high degree of trust that if we can get 
in, an email into the point of contact mailbox, it's going to get through to everybody else's. And that's where you start seeing where problems are going to be happening, where maybe they've blocked smtp.com. Uh, because we don't want to just blast out to everybody and have 100, 200 emails all get caught by the mail filters. It's just kind of a waste. Uh, so that's going to be the second group. The third group that I create is for um, you know all the targets. So as soon as uh, we know who everybody is, uh, and we kind of put all of those into our third group uh, for our eventual phishing campaign, you see that there is a bulk import users button. So if somebody, the company gives you a big CSV list, uh, you can just kind of import them all. Um, and there is a template because you will need to make sure that each of the columns are in the right order. Um, you need to get the right data in there as well. Or if you want to do one at a time, well, you can do that as well through the, those fields with that add button. Um, so that's how you can create the second part, our groups. Let's see. Do you do some recon for publicly facing services like SharePoint or email and clone the site? If so, is there anything you tend to not use? Um, yes, I definitely do clone the site. One of the things that I especially look for, um, really what I'm looking for is anything uh, that the employees are used to logging into. You know, if they use VPN pages a lot, maybe that's what I'll use. If there's something else that's internal for them, whether they have, uh, you know, whatever their authentication is, is something that uh, will very commonly try to clone just so it looks familiar to them. So they don't, nothing tips them off that something seems a little bit weird as well. All right, the email template, this is gonna be the actual fish. We're gonna put our pretexts in here as well. Uh, you know, this is where you get to get a little bit creative and get your story. <clears throat> so whatever your subject line is gonna be, something catchy to get them to open it and read it. Um, and you can also have HTML in the email, which maybe you'll want to do as well to kind of hide uh, your URL of the landing page that you are trying to get them to go to. There are a number, about a dozen or so variables that you can use with GoFish. We just see some of them, some examples in here as well with that curly curly dot email. Uh, that is gonna be uh, the user's email address, the target's email address. So you have that available. Uh, first name, so maybe you can kind of put right into your email, hello, first name. So it's you know a little more personable. As well as the last one, that dot URL, that's the landing page. That's gonna be the link that we're trying to get them to click on. And that's probably going to be the, the uh, link that you want to hide a little bit with the HTML email. We'll see an example of that as well. There are more of those variables available as well. Um, and you can see those at that URL that I included here that's in the Get GoFish docs in the user guide for the template reference. MZO or MZO asks, do you have already pre uh, created fake login pages for things like O365? Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, I mentioned that I work for Rapid7, there's a whole bunch of us on the team that do phishing, and a lot of times uh, we will kind of share those types of landing pages. Uh, since once you build one, it's really gonna look the same for others, whether that's a Cisco Easy Connect login page or any of those type, types of things as well. All right, last thing, the landing page. This is gonna be the, the fourth part that we're putting together. This is gonna be where we want our user to end up after they click on the link. Um, we do see that you can import a site. When you click on that import site button, it's gonna ask for the URL. Uh, what is the URL that you are trying to clone? And that might be the SharePoint, that might be the OA, the Outlook Web Access, or that might be the VPN page. Uh, that you're, uh, anything that is going to be familiar to the user because you just want them to feel comfortable, you don't want them looking around too, too much um, because you're probably not gonna have their company URL uh, on your landing page. It's not gonna, that won't work out too often. Uh, so that's why you want the landing page to, to look as good as possible. Sometimes with GoFish's import site, there are some issues where it might not work right because a lot of landing pages, a lot of login pages have a ton of JavaScript and cross-site scripting, uh, no, uh, cascading style sheets, CSS. Um, and a lot of, so that often leads to having to kind of build these things from scratch, which happens sometimes as well. Um, quite often I'm trying to capture credentials. So this is where my form is going to be, where I am asking them for their username and their password or anything else that I am trying to capture. Um, and then after they submit my form, 
I can redirect them anywhere I want. So at the bottom there, we see redirect to, I can redirect them to google.com, or I can redirect them back to their company's homepage, or I can redirect them to the actual login page. A lot of times redirecting them to the actual login page kind of makes sense, because after they put in their credentials, if it takes them back to what looks like the same page, they might think, well, something weird just happened. It was a glitch in the matrix, and they log in again, and then it takes them somewhere else. And really, we're trying not to tip people off. Um, a lot of phishing engagements can kind of come to a screeching halt as soon as somebody in the company realizes that it's phishing and they send out that company-wide email to say, look out for this email, it's a fish. Uh, so we're trying to really kind of lay low if we can with this type of thing. All right, so now we've created each of our four pieces. We created our sending profile. We created our users uh, in groups. Uh, we created our fish through the email and we created our landing page. Once we have those four things, we can start stitching this all together. Uh, so we can name our campaign, put it all together. Whatever is that email template, the name that we gave it, we put that into the next field. The landing page, whatever we name that one, we put that there as well. For the URL, the URL is going to be um, a domain that we have. It, you don't, you're not required to have a domain with uh, GoFish. You can certainly use just the IP address. This is gonna be where the landing page is. This is gonna be where GoFish server is running. Um, and this is where you might want to go buy some kind of uh, domain. In my examples that we have, uh, when we actually go through this at all, um, the one that I'm using is, like I mentioned, I run the DEF CON 401 group. So I actually own dc401.org. Uh, for, uh, for this demo, uh, what I did was I went out and purchased dc40l.org. And that's just because an L and a one can often look very similar if you're not looking too quickly or with certain fonts, it's gonna look identical. And that's one of the tricks that I often like when uh, my targets have an I or an L in their domain name. That's one of the things that I will often try to uh, switch. Um, it's pretty easy to switch between a lowercase L and an uppercase I in, in, in the text. Uh, and those types of things make it really hard to find or other types of uh, URLs that are kind of fun to use that other people on my team uh, might go grab is they try to make it look like a subdomain using a hyphen. Uh, we know that there's no such thing as a subdomain with a hyphen, but let's say, for example, that you are um, attacking rapid7.com. Uh, what you can kind of do then is you can, if it's available, you can go out and you can go grab maybe training-rapid7.com or hr-rapid7.com, or whatever is the company name that you're trying to uh, do your phishing engagement for. And some people might think that that's going to be a uh, subdomain of the company and think that that looks valid as well. So those are some of the things that you can kind of grab for domains and use that as your URL. And then the last two pieces that we have down there after the launch date, which you know pre-fills as now, or you can schedule it into the future, the sending profile, you know the uh, the mail server information that you put in earlier and the groups that you want to go this uh, have the email sent to. For the first one, I have it sent to me and make sure everything works. For the second one, to just myself and my client uh, to make sure that it's going to get into the company's uh, inbox. And then finally, I'll switch it out to uh, the group that has my whole targets. Another question, do you ever get asked to sell, transfer a typo squatting lookalike domain to the client afterwards? Yes, absolutely. Um, it, it's, since it's gonna look a whole lot like one of theirs, it's uh, I've taken that one off the market for other people to buy. So yeah, I'll definitely uh, transfer that to the customer when the engagement is up. All right, so if we have a really basic one, this one might be an email that was received. You know, this one is coming from, we saw um, inside of our mail uh, sender template that, uh, where it's coming from, from our DEFCON 401 at Gmail is where it came from. I am trying to hack you, but this one is not really a very good fish because there's no link in there. So that one wouldn't really work too well. Let's add a link by putting into our email, uh, remember that uh, curly curly dot URL. Uh, when we put our curly curly URL in there, uh, might look something like that. So we can use that variable, which is going to end up being our landing page. What happens when we actually send that one out to users as well? Well, this one, I'm trying to hack you, so click on my link here, HTTPS, you know, our URL, if we're using just an IP address, and then there's this RID at the end, this relative ID. Each 
each target gets their own unique RID, which is how GoFish does its tracking. Um, I don't have a slide on it, but another good thing um, that you can do in here is inside of your email template for your fish, um, you can use HTML uh, text. You can, uh, and one thing that you can do here is you can hide uh, this, this landing page, this link with a RID in it inside of HTML. So maybe you kind of put that inside of an href tag with the, the .url, and then you put some other text in there that looks really familiar to them. You know, like uh, log into the VPN page, log into the company SharePoint or whatever the company calls it. So that way it just looks familiar to them again. If they, you know, do the usual mouse over thing, they're gonna see this link. Uh, but that's, you know, part of what we're hoping that they do. We're kind of hoping that they do those types of checks so that they don't go through um, and actually get fished. If they click on that link, uh, here we have a really basic landing page. I didn't really clone one. I just kind of built one from scratch here and we see that that RID is up in the URL uh, and they can kind of put in their credentials here if they choose. If we want to go super easy on them and have this really ugly uh, form asking for their username and their password that way. Once they put in the credentials, Back in our admin screen, remember when we started this thing up, um, running at that port 3333 is our admin screen. Um, there's a whole bunch of really great reporting and it's all in real time. This is one of the most fun things about an engagement. As soon as you send out those emails, we see that that email sent circle uh, starts filling up and it kind of shows how many have actually made it um, off of the GoFish server. It doesn't guarantee that they've been received. It just means that GoFish has actually sent them. And then inside of the email, uh, GoFish includes a one-by-one -one pixel image, uh, which notifies the GoFish server when the email has been opened. Uh, you can kind of think on a lot of emails, you know, you can kind of see sometimes there might be down in the signature, a company logo or anything like that. Uh, well, email clients aren't gonna have that, that image or that logo. The email client needs to go out to a web server to request image from somewhere. So that's what GoFish does, is it puts a, a one pixel image inside of the email, which notifies uh, GoFish that the email has been opened when the email client requests that one pixel image. Now the real fun starts. We start seeing as users click on links, um, and th these numbers all get updated in real time. You'll see there is a refresh button, you know, if you're impatient. Uh, but the fourth one there, the uh, submitted data is the most fun one. Once we start seeing that one go through, we know we got credentials. That's where we start seeing uh, the usernames and the passwords come in as well. There is functionality in GoFish for email reported. Uh, if somebody kind of responds, writes back, there's API hooks that are available that we can kind of have that one um, in there as well. I don't really use that one too much. I just more care about these first four. So when somebody submits their data, how do we get their username and their password? Well, we have all this kind of really great reporting, all this tracking, where we can see exactly uh, who the person was that we were trying to uh, get credentials from. We see that RID, that result ID, uh, when the email was specifically sent, exactly where, uh, when the link was clicked, we see their operating system, their browser, um, as well as the data that was submitted. The best part, is all the way down there at the bottom. We do have that username and that password. There is a replay credentials, which I would say be extremely careful with because what that does is when you click on that button, it's gonna ask for a URL and it's asking for a URL where you want to submit credentials to. So if you don't have permission to log in somewhere with these credentials, again, you'll be kind of breaking the law. So be careful with that as well. Uh, does GoFish encrypt the data since it is username and password? Well, that depends. Um, in transmission, it's going to depend if your landing page um, is behind uh, TLS, uh, but on the server, no, it's not encrypted on the server. Uh, if you go through that documentation, it says in the documentation that uh, the credentials are stored in clear text on the server. Uh, so you'll probably want to go get a certificate in order to ensure that things are going to be sent over the wire encrypted. Uh, and on the uh, being able to, uh, and then just being aware that these are uh, stored in clear text on the, the server as well. Do you ever run into issues then with email clients that don't display image by default, like Gmail? If so, do you purposely put information and images to make them turn it on? Um, I don't. 
And the only thing that that's really going to then affect um, is going to be the uh, whether the email was opened. From there, what's going to be the issue is the uh, email opened and the clicked link numbers will be the same, which you know you can kind of figure things out from there. Um, Honey Badger wants to know, do you have to tell your clients that the data is being stored on your server in clear text? Yeah, you probably should let them know about that. Uh, and we can also, you know, that's a, a great point that, you know, something to look into for the future uh, about whether GoFish can possibly encrypt these things, uh, which, you know, that would be definitely better, I agree. All right, so more info on the pieces. Well, we kind of, uh, went over each of these, the groups, you wanna have a couple of the groups or a few of the groups, you wanna have one with you, you and your client, your targets, the landing page, what are you trying to get? Are you trying to get your username and the password? Um, let's see, sending profile, You know, how are you going to get these things out? Um, you're using Gmail, G Suite, smtp.com, Mailhog, anything like that. And then the uh, template, uh, what are different pretexts that you can kind of think about? How mean should you go? And my opinion on how mean, how tough that you should go is to match or slightly exceed uh, the, the training level. Uh, you don't really want to go too hardcore on people that have not been trained or made aware. Uh, and you can also do a little bit of OSINT on how much that the company knows about, especially for uh, your uh, pretexts as well. One example that I had a, a while back was I was doing a little bit of OSINT on my target and I saw that the company was having some kind of fun thing. It was some kind of tasting. I couldn't remember whether they were having like a beer tasting, hot dog, catch. it was something crazy that for lunch they were having a tasting. So I thought, this works out really well. What if I use a pretext to send them a form so that they can give their feedback on the tasting? You know, that could have been one that work, would have worked out pretty well uh, where they probably would have believed it. Other ranges of levels, well, you've seen the Nigerian Prince ones where you have a long lost relative looking to give you millions of dollars in gold. That's one that most people are probably going to catch on to. Uh, and that's gonna be a pretty low level one. Uh, sales deals, coupons, everybody loves coupons. Um, I had, sometimes that works for me. I've had ones before where I've just taken like a coffee shop gift card, Dunkin' Donuts, Starbucks, any of those types of gift cards, put it on my scanner, I put it into an Excel spreadsheet. Uh, I kind of fuzz over the activation code and just say, you have to enable macros in order to see the activation code, which isn't really true either as well. Any kind of problems with accounts, people kind of get nervous about that. We mentioned HR policy updates before. Once you start getting into problems with paychecks or problems with bonuses, people get really worked up about those types of things. And if you also kind of hit them up near the end of their day, uh, those are also going to be extremely successful as well. I've had multiple times where I tried to go as far as problems with paychecks and bonuses and those pretexts get shut down really quick. The question about email attachments, um, do you wanna have some malware and shells getting past some of the servers as well? Yeah, good, good luck, you can kind of uh, test those things out. That's getting harder and harder by the day. I got people on my team that focus on that kind of stuff as well, but I like to focus on the social engineering, trying to get credentials from people is, um, kind of the area that I like to do with this as well. Um, let's see. All right, so we can do a fish real quick. We can see, put it all together and do it in real time. So I have this server that I have completely set up. We see that I do have it running at 127.001 on my port 333. Uh, we don't have any campaigns yet. So let's go ahead and set one up. Uh, let's see, we have our DARPCON campaign for a email template. I have a few different ones where I have a simple one. Um, I got one that looks just like that basic form. And then I also have one with the URL obfuscated that is intended to kind of look similar to like maybe a Cisco VPN page um, or it's asking, uh, I have the URL hidden in there um, where my landing page here is the one that might look like my um, Cisco uh, VPN. Uh, or we have where the landing page actually is at DC, I mentioned 40L.org instead of DC 401. A sending profile, going through that Gmail and the group, uh, let's say, I'm gonna probably have to create, I forgot that I created, didn't create a group for this. So let's do um, DerpCon and Derp. 
DerpCon and let's use Mailinator, which is just a free open mail service that doesn't have any kind of credentials on it whatsoever. So our fish is gonna go to DerpCon at Mailinator. Now we can kind of go back and do our campaign. Derp. Uh, let's obfuscate, make it our best one, make it our good looking VPN page. We're gonna go to DC. 40l.org, our Gmail profile, and now we want our DerpCon group. When we click our launch campaign, it is going to say, are you sure? Yep, we are definitely sure. We want this to go. It kicks off, and we see that our, uh, our admin page gets updated immediately. If we refresh it, we see that the email has been sent. Well, let's go see if we can find that mail in the mailbox. Oh, there it is. We have our email that was from DEFCON 401. Pizza and beer count, derp. Thank you for registering for the DEFCON 401 talk, how to fish. Uh, we have lots of people, many don't show up, so we need pizza and beer. Please confirm by going to the VPN page, happy fishing. Once we go there, kind of looks a little bit like a VPN page. You can do whatever kind of customizing that you want here as well. Things like, oh, let's be a black hat hacker. Uh, my username might be derp. My password is super secret password. And even if there's a 2FA, you know, we have that kind of thing in there. We can ask for that as well. Log in. Where does it take us? It redirects us back to the DC 401 page. But most importantly, let's see, did we capture credentials? No updates yet. Refresh. Look at that. The email was opened. We get that notification. The, email, the link was clicked and data was submitted. We see it down here. Campaign created, email sent, clicked, view the details, and there we go. We have our username derp, black hat hacker type. We have our 2FA, we got our super secret password. We were able to capture credentials, all stepping right through, uh, being able to put all of our pieces together and get all of that um, in one place. Let's get caught up on some of the questions as well. Is the times clicked just measured per user, even if they click it multiple times? Yes, if you click your link five times, that will be five clicks on uh, the counter. And there are ways that you can also go in uh, with some of the reporting and see individual statistics as well. Uh, we do see how many times that somebody, each individual opens the email, how many times each individual clicks on the email, and then also how many times that they might submit credentials as well. Um, have you ever tried any form of tracking for attachment opens to verify which user pulled it down? Um, I have some quick and dirty methods using embedded images and tokens within the attachments, but I have not found a great way to do that just yet. Um, one of the, I, what I think you're referring to with this is to see uh, which, let's see, for this one, the image is going to be tied to the RID, so it's also going to know specifically which user it was that opened the email, so we have that um, going to be there uh, as well. Honey Badger says, if you click the link five times, you need to be locked in a room. Well, yeah, there's certainly lots of people, and it's kind of interesting. This is one of my favorite things that I like to say with this. A lot of times in the security field, we hear uh, some people referring to their employees as dumb, as stupid, because they clicked on links. And I don't think that they're stupid. I like to just say that we haven't made them aware. I think that's on us as the security professionals to make our people more aware of what phishing looks like, to make sure that they're properly trained. There probably is always gonna be somebody that you can train them till you're blue in the face and you think that you've told them everything that's still going to do it. But all of this is about awareness, making sure that they know uh, what a phishing engagement is gonna look like in different ways that they can protect against these types of things as well. All right, Marcelo, I think I went through most of the questions that were in the uh, Discord. Did you get any others that came through? Yeah, Go to yeah definitely. I got a, I got a, I got a bunch of them. So uh, Juan Gonzalieri asks on uh, GoToWebinar, do you recommend Evil Nginx or any other alternative? Um, those are really great for capturing multi-factor authentication. Um, I know of other people on my team that use other things like Evil Genesis Gen X and swear by it and think it's awesome. I just haven't used it so much yet. Um, I just stay simple with these kind of go fish, fish engagements. Um, you can certainly also use things like Metasploit Pro. There's lots of different tools out there that you can use. This is the one that I like. It's free, it's easy, it works. 
Awesome. And uh, Kay Lu asks, uh, can you get the email to Outlook to an Outlook inbox? Some companies use Office 365 and the domain gets flagged pretty quickly by Spam House. Um, if they have the kind of flagging in place, um, I'll try to see if they can lift it. Um, if it's impossible for them to lift it, well, that's something that's probably going to be an issue. If we can't get the email into the user's inbox, we can't do a social engineering engagement. We can't go after the people. So I really need to work with uh, the company that's hired me to ensure that I can get the email into there. Uh, and again, if they want to be testing their networks and testing their filters, that's great, but that's not a social engineering engagement. So we really want to be sure that we are testing the users. Awesome, and holy crap, you have a lot of questions. So I'm gonna, this is gonna be a, a round, this is gonna be a fast round of questions. You, you got like 30 seconds to answer. Uh, so, considering it's an external phishing campaign, do you think grabbing NTLM v1, v2 hashes is worth it? Also, no yes. SMB ports were found to be open to. Also, no SMB ports were found to be open to an external world go. Um, but yeah, I think you get the gist of it. Yeah, if I can get hashes, that that's great. Um, I, I think a company is going to be happy with my work, unhappy with their people. If I'm getting NTLM hashes externally. Um, even if I can't necessarily do anything with them, maybe eventually I could have given enough time, but um, yeah, that, that's a great thing to be able to grab as well. Awesome, okay, we got three minutes. So uh, if you, what, what do we got? We got a question from a honey badger who says, uh, does GoFish encrypt the data since it's username and password? We answered that. And do you have to tell your clients that? That's actually a good question. Uh, it's a great thing to tell your clients that so that they are aware of the entire environment. Um, so, yes. Awesome. Um, have you tried, oh, I think you answered that one. Sorry about that. Uh, who is your favorite, most successful role to spoof to get to the most clicks? Um, I, I, I often really like uh, going after people's greed. One of my favorite engagements was I was doing this for a university um, with, that had a major uh, football team, college football team, and I offered uh, tickets to the football game and told people they had to log in to make sure that they only entered once and one person entered three times. So how did they do that? Well, they had their username and password, uh, their spouse's username and password, and a friend's username and password, which when I showed that report to the CSO, his head exploded. Alrighty, and uh, let me see if we missed anything here. Uh, yeah, I'll definitely be watching on the Discord, or people can DM me or anything. Like, I'm more than happy to answer questions anyway. Yeah, and actually, I think MZO had a really good question about: Is there any CTF like fishing contest for for practice, or even friendly competitions for trying to fish each other? Just curious how you can actually practice it hands on. It's actually a good point. Yeah, it, that that is. I've never seen anything that is like a CTF for phishing um, because, <laughs> you know, you do have to trick people and they kind of have to be in on it as well for it to be legal. I think that would be fun if there was a way to set up that kind of thing. I'd, maybe one way you can do it is just kind of ask your friends, like, I'm not saying when, but can I fish you and see what happens? All righty, uh, and let me see if there are a couple, I think there were a couple of one. Um, oh man, there are a lot of them in here. I think you, you answered most of them though. I think, oh. did you answer the, uh, from CloudStrike, how does GoFish work with orgs that enforce DMARC, SPF, and DKIM compliance? Um, yeah, the answer for that one is again, I, I'm uh, going to it, work with my client to just kind of make sure that the email is getting through into the inbox. And a lot of times that's something that does get handled upstream before it gets to my hands, um, that hopefully our salespeople or whoever comes before me talks to the company about those types of things. But if it gets all the way to me um, with those types of restrictions in place, then again, it's going to be having the conversation about this being social engineering and seeing if they are able to lift any of those filters so that I can get the mail into the inboxes. Awesome. Uh, let me see. Ah, this is actually a good one. Another one from Juan on Google webinar. What, are, what ruses have you found to be effective for your phishing campaigns? Um, yeah, going, 
attacking people's greed, attacking people's concern over their money, thing going after bonuses, telling them that, like their payroll direct deposit um, has a problem, or offering uh, like inexpensive prizes so they're believable. Things like a five dollar gift card. That type of thing is believable. Um, that you can win a five dollar gift card if you get give information about the new company portal that is being set up. Those types of things people are are really going to uh, go for, and they quite often do work. Awesome. So we, and I think that's it. Unfortunately, I think we don't have any more time for questions. Uh, so thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, Patrick, for your talk. Awesome.